Good morning, and, uh, and thank you for attending. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. John Connolly and his daughter, Sarah. Uh, Gloria uh, Connolly, uh, John's wife, is uh, with us as well, uh, sitting in the public gallery. Uh, the Connollys are the parents of uh, John Connolly, Jr., who met with a sudden and unexpected death on December the 9th, 2001. And already uh, facing the tragedy of the incomprehensible death of their son, uh, the Connollys literally from that day have been confronted by obstacles, indifference, and stonewalling as they've sought to learn the truth about what actually happened. There are public systems in place and a coroner's office with public duties assigned by law to discharge exactly what the Connollys, like any other family, sought and are still seeking. Unfortunately, as, as has been the case in this province too often recently, uh, the independent medical investigative duty of the coroner's office appears to have taken a backseat to uh, self-serving justification of snap decisions and past conduct. And that's what uh, brings us here today. I first met with the family in April of uh, 2007 as they were trying to get officials in both the coroner's office and the Ministry of Community Safety to discharge their public duties in this case. And like other f Ontario families who have tried to get straight answers from the coroner's office, their legitimate questions were met with delay, disregard, and institutional self-interest instead of action to get at the truth. And immediately following their son's death, they identified and provided key evidence that the coroner's office somehow missed or that contradicted the findings and the facts on which they were based. When the stonewalling started, the Connollys persisted and managed to obtain 2,500 pages of previously withheld materials that showed the original decision was clearly not sustainable and that a review was required. And I want to salute the Health Professions Appeal Review Board for ordering that disclosure because it confirmed what the coroner's office was ignoring. And I'll always remember uh, Gloria Connolly explaining to me that she just wanted public officials to do their duty and she was right then, and she's right today. I've personally raised this case with uh, Ministers Quinter and Bartolucci, uh, both of whom at the time had the power to direct an inquest. Both said they would review it. Regrettably, nothing has happened. And as recent events have shown, exposed because of families like the Connollys and investigative reporting, there have simply been too many instances where the coroner's office forgets its public role as a medical investigator, and that must end. Some of you will know that the Liberal government recently changed the law to remove the minister's responsibility and replace it with an oversight committee, a committee that's yet to be appointed. As Dr. Connolly will outline, they have once again formally presented the coroner with the accumulated evidence. They've requested that he discharge his public duty by invoking his authority to reclassify the death in accordance with the law and coroner's office policy and by directing a new investigation or ordering an inquest. And I hope the coroner will at long last act properly, but if he doesn't, I assure you we will be holding this government to account to ensure this new oversight is not just another dodge of uh, political responsibility. And with that introduction, I'd like to invite uh, Sarah to uh, offer a few comments. Sarah. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Insman, for holding this media conference and giving me and my family the opportunity to bring the details regarding John's death and the struggles that my parents have faced in front of the Ontario legislator and the public. John Kevin Conley was my brother. He was three years my junior and he was and continues to be one of the most influential people in my life. John lived life with great joy, enthusiasm and optimism. His good nature was infectious. When he gave you a slap on the back and looked at you with his large grin, it was easy to smile back. He was a kind and thoughtful person who had a great compassion for others. He would reach out to people without hesitation. 
When I was about 12, my grandfather was hospitalized. John and I were brought home early from school. And I remember my mom sitting on her bed packing with tears in her eyes. I stopped at the door. John walked straight in the room and wrapped his arms around her. He was never afraid to comfort others. He was never afraid to do the right thing. He lived my by, by my grandfather's words. You know you are doing the right thing when it costs you. He stood by his family and friends, and even people he didn't know. For example, in high school, when a younger boy was being bullied, it was John that stepped in and helped the boy who was being targeted. John had a great drive and courage to accomplish whatever task was at hand. I remember watching John learn how to roll a kayak. He started early in the afternoon and he didn't leave the water until he succeeded. I remember watching John play rugby, one game in particular. John was running the ball upfield when he was tackled by about three or four players. John went down, but he didn't give up the ball. I then saw him struggling to get to his feet. He did. He then started to move forward, and eventually he was dragging the players that had tackled him. This kind of strength and determination was what had earned him the nickname Tiger. John's drive to succeed was also evident in his academic work. He was a dedicated student. He worked well under pressure, and he would not give up when the task at hand became difficult. I visited John when he was a pharmacy student at the University of Toronto. We often studied together. He was organized and focused. His academic aspirations were high. After pharmacy, he had planned to apply to medicine. Whether John was preparing for an exam or running a race, he would persevere. He was not a quitter. These stories just give you a glimpse of who John was as a person. His zest for life lifted people up and he was an inspiration to many. His quiet honesty, his integrity, and his courage to do the right thing earned him great respect and love amongst his family and his peers. As a high school teacher of John's once said, they just don't make them like that anymore. It is horrific that on December 9th, 2001, when John suffered a violent, sudden, and unexpected death, that the police and coroner's office failed him. John died on December 9th, and hours after his death, the police closed the case. This was done before interviewing his family, before a forensic autopsy was done, and before toxicology screening had been completed. When my parents identified John, no one met them. And no meetings with the police or coroner's office had been arranged. After many phone calls on the evening of December 9th, we were squeezed in to see Detective Fargi at Old City Hall on December 10th at 9.30 in the morning between court cases he was attending. When we arrived at Old City Hall, a room had not been arranged for us and our meeting was brief. With the time that we had been given, we explained our concerns regarding inconsistencies of John's dress, the investigation, 